frog neurulation neurulation accomplishes three major things it creates a neural tube which gives rise to central nervous system it creates the neural crest which migrates away from the dorsal surface of the neural tube and gives rise to a diverse set of cell types and it creates the bona fide epidermis which covers the neural tube one neural tube is created so these are the three major things that comes under neurulation the first one is neural tube formation and the neural tube the neural tube uh, is always a dorsal one in the gastrula the presumptive material for nerve system uh, uh, gastrula stage uh, it is arranged in a such a way the micromeres micromeres are present on the dorsal side whereas macromeres are present on the uh, vegetal near that vegetal pole the cells near that uh, from that uh, animal pole layer what happens is uh, in gastrula this presumptive material for nerve system it lies on the mid dorsal line mid dorsal line of uh, animal pole as a plate and this plate is called neural plate the whole cell the whole blastoderm the micromeres are present and from this micromere a plate like uh, dorsal side a plate uh, like cell arises and uh, that is already present there that starts to change and this plate it becomes a plate like structure and this plate is called neural plate or medullary plate this extends from the dorsal lip of the blastopore to the anterior end soon the edges of the neural plate become thickened these two edges that become thickened and what happens is uh, they start to rise above this a groove occurs here and this to rise and this rising results in neural fold or medullary fold neural folds of the two sides are continuous anteriorly to form the transverse neural folds so from the anterior side to the posterior side these uh, folds arise and there you have the uh, groove which is known as neural groove so this fold starts to rise and the when this fold starts to rise a groove is found the plate which was covering the dorsal surface now it has become a groove and on a, either side you have the fold and this fold uh, grows inward grows inward and meets together to form what is known as neural tube these edges meet together and fuse to form what is known as neural tube and the canal what we used to call the neural uh, groove that has become a canal within this neural tube and this canal is known as neuroseal it is known as neuroseal so once the two edges meet together there are cells on either side of this edge now what happens is those cells those cells uh, since these two edges meet together those cells cover up this neural tube and this neural tube it uh, start it starts to lie deep it moves uh, deep into the interior portion the fusion first starts just behind it's not the anterior portion the posterior portion where fusion of these neural folds starts the new anteriorly the neural tube opens to the exterior for some time by anterior neuro pore it becomes closed soon posteriorly the neural folds enclose the blastopore in such a way that the neuroseal communicates with the arc and drawn through the blastopore so blastopore is there at the posterior end and then you have the arc and drawn so this neuroseal neuroseal is in connection with the arc and drawn through blastopore the short narrow canal connecting the arc and drawn and neuroseal is neurentric canal later that also this after the neural folds have fused in the medial line the neural tube separates itself completely from the overlying epidermis the free edges of the epidermis they fuse together so that the epidermis become
continuous over as neural tube and this fusing together takes place at the posterior end as the neural tube is separated from the this becomes a complete tube and this separates off from the ectodermal cells a certain number of uh, once it is separated from ectoderm a certain number of loose cells are liberated from the neural fold this neural fold region which is part of neural tube those cells they liberate few cells in the space between the ectoderm and the neural tube these cells they arrange themselves as two longitudinal bands on the dorsolateral wall of the neural tube these cell constitute what is known as neural crust later the neural crust cells differentiate into the ganglia of the cranial and spinal nerves melanophores adrenal medullae and visceral skeleton those cells those cells are uh, arised from this uh, neural uh, tube cells so they also form um, the, uh, from there you have the peripheral nervous system uh, which includes the spinal nerves then you have the melanophores coming from it then adrenal medullae and visceral skeleton comes from this neural crest the anterior portion of the neural tube it differentiates into the brain and the posterior portion of the neural tube it forms the spinal cord and these two parts the brain and spinal cord these are part of central nervous system so neural tube is central nervous system the embryonic stage which is having the neural plate or the neural tube is called neurula which once the neural tube uh, from neural plate formation to neural tube you call the embryo neurula you call the embryo neurula and after gastrula starts formation of neurula and the process is known as neurulation so this is the picture where the embryo the dorsal surface of the embryo it starts a small depression occurs then the fold grows together and this start to meet together these edges the four edges of the fold they start to meet together and they form what is known as neural tube and the region between the epidermis and this neural tube few cells few loosely arranged cells are present which is liberated from this neural tube and that area is known as neural crest neuro seal that is the region within the neural tube development of brain the anterior part of neural tube it is distinguished as encephalon which develops into various parts of the brain through thickening thinning vagination and invagination first it's a neural tube that is formed later this neural tube it has to differentiate into brain and spinal cord and in the brain itself uh, the primary uh, primarily this brain uh, the anterior end of the neural tube which we now start to call as brain that is actually divided into three main subdivisions called prosencephalon mesencephalon and rhombencephalon prosencephalon which is the forebrain mesencephalon which is midbrain and rhombencephalon which is hindbrain and uh, you know that cavities are there within this which is known as uh, prosocele which is present in prosencephalon then you have the mesocele within mesencephalon or midbrain and then you have rhombocele within the hindbrain so this is a structure of a frog brain you have studied it in detail you have studied it in detail and you know the ventricles all those structures now the ventricle is what we call as a proseal uh, rhombencephal and all so later now it's not in that brain is actually in this form it is actually in this prosencephalon form where it's the brain the neural tube is starting to differentiate into prosencephalon mesencephalon as well as rhombencephalon this is modifications within the anterior portions so first initially three region occurs prosencephalon mesencephalon and rhombencephalon see this picture that uh, 
posterior region the posterior region of prosencephalon that starts to bend the posterior region of prosencephalon that starts to bend and the area of uh, uh, cranial flexure thickens to develop the tuberculum posteriors that marks the posterior limit of forebrain the most uh, anterior division of the forebrain that is the telencephalon the telencephalon is the anterior anterior portion of the forebrain with its original cavity the teleocele the anterior limit of telencephalon is the lamina terminalis which you can see here the lamina terminalis which is the anterior limit of telencephalon so telencephalon that is the anterior part and this anterior part of telencephalon is what is known as lamina terminalis which will separate the future cerebral hemispheres by a longitudinal groove the lamina terminalis represents the anterior fused neuroporal area and the telencephalon is the embryonic cerebrum its cavity expands uh, laterally to give rise to the right and left lateral ventricles and the surrounding thick wall cerebral hemispheres at about 12 mm stage these ventricles are laterally compressed in the frog the cerebral hemispheres are first differentiated at the 7 mm stage but never become very large so this is uh, the telencephalon differentiating the posterior portion of this prosencephalon that bends uh, downward ventrally which is a characteristic feature of caudata the two telencephalic vesicles are partially constricted off from each other but they remain connected by way of the tubular foramen of munro which opens into the common third ventricle Uh, so there the <coughs> two vent telencephalic vesicles they actually form the cerebral hemisphere future cerebral hemisphere and they are connected together though they are completely constricted off they remain connected by means of foramen of munro uh, which opens into the common third ventricle and the third ventricle is something which overlaps and connects the telocele and the diocele they become fused medially and the nerves originating from the olfactory lobes they innervate the nasal epithelium or olfactory placot so here in the developed one you can see the olfactory nerves uh, and the olfactory lobes the ventricle enclosed by the olfactory lobe uh, is known as all of all factor seal the roof of the cerebral lobes they thicken to give rise to cortex or pallium and the floor and sides of which form the corpora striata the olfactory lobes arise as a pair of evaginations from the anterior ventral part of the telencephalon diencephalon or thalamen cephalon or between brain the structure um, this is actually part of prosencephalon the structural derivatives of this diencephalon it includes a posterior commissure uh, just anterior to the dorsal limit of the mesencephalon and anterior to this is the epiphyseal recess and the dorsal medial sac saccula outgrowth known as the epiphysis this continues to grow forward and become separated from the brain as a small knob of cells which remain in the adult as the bro spot you know uh, uh, frogs frogs they have a bro spot and this uh, bro spot is actually uh, formed from this diencephalon and it is presumably homologous to the pineal gland of higher vertebrates and anterior to the epiphysis in the roof of the diencephalon and between it and the anterior choroid plexus are the hebinular ganglion and the commissure in front of this there later develops a dorsal outgrowth which is known as paraphysis it is known as paraphysis and in the floor of the diencephalon 
you find the uh, anterior to the tuberculum posterior tuberculum posterior that is the posterior margin anterior to this tuberculum posterior you find an vesicular evagination which is known as infundibulum and the cells of the infundibulum will combine with approximated and pigmented cells of the ingrown hypophysis to form the pituitary gland of the adult so um, the infundibulum and the hypophysis which is part of this diencephalon that is later formed the infundibulum cells it gives rise to the posterior part of the pituitary gland and retain a hollow infundibular stalk connection with the brain and the hypophysis that becomes the anterior part of the pituitary gland during metamorphosis the individual lobes of the pituitary gland differ both in gross morphology finer structure between the infundibulum and the tuberculum posterior is a secondary and posteriorly directed pocket which is known as mammillary recess a pronounced thickening appears in front of the infundibulum which is called optic chiasma it there it develops later it thickens in front of the infundibulum to form what is known as optic chiasma this is optic chiasma and here you have the optic recess which is actually a depression which is actually a depression in this region and this depression is known as optic recess and in front of the optic recess there appears a ventral thickening which is called torus transversus here you have what is known as torus transversus which is actually a ventral thickening torus trans the optic vesicles they begin to develop very early as ventrolateral outgrowths of the diocele the expansion of the diocele it provides a temporary and slight thinning of the walls of the optic vesicles as the vesicles make contact with the lateral head ectoderm that portion of the vesicle in the contact begins to thicken and then invaginate to form a two layered optic cup actually uh, the optic cup it is formed as an expansion of the diocele the diocele it provides a temporary and slight thinning of the walls of the optic vesicles the optic vessels they become thin and as these vesicles make contact with the lateral head ectoderm that portion of the vesicle in the contact begins to thicken and so this results in an invagination and this forms the uh, outer one that has uh, that is uh, uh, thinning it is formed of thinning and the other one that is formed of thickening so this forms together a two layered optic cup in this picture you can see the optic chiasma which is formed and the optic recess the most lateral and invaginated portion of the cup will become the retina the medial layer will become the pigmented layer of the eye and the connecting and somewhat constricted tube the optic stop the nervous elements of this optic stalk it will join to the in the optic chiasma which contains the optic nerve fiber tracks from the two sides the stalk it will develop around an inverted groove and this inverted groove is known as choroid fissure it is known as choroid fissure which will contain within the groove accessory nerves and blood vessels which help in supplementing the retina mesencephalon this portion of the brain functions largely as a pathway of nerve tracks between the anterior prosencephalon and the posterior rhomboid cephalon these tracks are found principally within the paired ventrolateral thickenings of the walls and the floor on either side of the tuberculum posteriors they are known as crura cerebri and the original dorsal thickening becomes subdivided by a median fissure into paired dorsolateral thickenings these are known as optic lobes or corpora by genina they do not reach their full development until the time of metamorphosis and anterior to these lobes is the posterior commissure from the posterior limits of the mesencephalon and optic lobes may be seen the valvulae cerebelli 
and the fourth pair of cranial nerves which is trochlea which emerge from the dorsolateral wall the original cavity of the midbrain the mesocele connects with the rhombocele which is called the fourth ventricle with the third ventricle which becomes narrow and it is known as aqueductus of silvia ventricles that you find in the later or the developed stage developed stage one's development completes the rhombencephalon the rhombencephalon is the hind brain this portion of the brain is clearly marked off from the mesencephalon by a transverse constriction in the roof of the brain at the posterior limit of the dorsal thickening there appears a slight transverse thickening in the roof of the rhombencephalon which corresponds to the metencephalon of higher forms and develops into a small cerebellum pan vascular and folds into the Uh, posterior to this the roof becomes broad thin rhombocele uh, as the posterior choroid plexus is seen the ventral and ventrolateral walls of the rhombocephalon are known as medulla oblongata from which arise the cranial nerves 4 5 to 10 the walls become thickened by fibers which form numerous pathways from brain and spinal cord the rhombocele or cavity of the hind brain is known as the fourth ventricle which communicates posteriorly with the central canal of the spinal cord and anteriorly with the aqueduct of sylvius of the meso